So in Psalm 2 verse 9, it says, uh, You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Quite sort of aggressive language. Um, now, just to try and help us make sense of the kind of writing that's going on there, uh, the Bible sometimes uses smaller images uh, to illustrate larger issues, things that we might have a problem grasping in our mind. Sometimes the Bible uses everyday images to help us understand. So it says there, talking about the, the, the sinfulness and the, and the ruin of the world, it says, uh, and the, the wicked who are opposing God and opposing godliness, it says you'll break them with a rod of iron, dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. In other words, that the whole world in its rebellion against God, with unrighteousness and injustice and all the horrible sinful things that we see all around us, that kind of opposition to God, God ultimately will smash it to the ground like a like a piece of pottery. That's what's being said there. He'll decisively bring all that to an end. And then there's a couple of other similar um, images used. So in Isaiah 34 verse 4, it says, All the host of heaven shall rot away, and the skies roll up like a scroll. All their host shall fall, as leaves fall from the vine, like leaves falling from the fig tree. Again, using the image that um, godlessness, ultimately the sinfulness of the world, all the ruin we see around us, will fall to the ground like leaves do in the autumn or in the fall. Leaves falling to the ground, it can't sustain, it can't, um, it's not permanent, it will fall. God will make sure it falls like leaves to the ground. And then Isaiah 40 uses another image, 40 verse 15 says, Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket, and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Again, amazing images saying sort of like all the nations, the whole world is like a drop from a bucket before God. It's just so infinitesimally small compared to the hugeness, the majesty of God. And using such images helps us to understand um, the scale of the world in comparison to God, or its smallness compared to God. God is just so enormously huge. The nations, the whole globe, is like a drop that falls from the bucket. Now anyone can therefore find these images quite helpful to get the perspective and the scale right when we think about God and we think about humanity. And what these images are meant to do is to actually humble mankind, humble us, to make us realise how absolutely small mankind is, and really to silence our noise, um, to silence our pride, to make us aware of our frailty before God, our, our insignificance before God, unless he makes us significant. It's a... It's a language to make us sit quietly before God with our faces in the dust say Lord we are but nothing that's what these images uh, create now these verses um, uh, come towards the end of a certain part of the Messiah and we're drawing to the close of the second part of the Messiah so we've in these recent studies we've had uh, Christ ascended and we've had the gospel announced then we've had how beautiful are the feet who take the, the, the gospel. Uh, then we've had the sound going forth to the ends of the nations, the purposes of God to take the gospel to the ends of the nations. We've had, then we've seen opposition awakened, opposition that's unreasonable. Why on earth would you oppose Christ who did nothing but kindness to people? And then opposition ineffectual. And then this piece closes the second part of Messiah, which is like opposition ultimately will be destroyed. Now just to hone in a bit on this particular part as we come to the end of the second part of, of how the Messiah is structured. And I think we have to say, well, Christ the Messiah does rule in life over sinful mankind. Uh, and it's important we understand when we say sinful man, we mean every human being that has ever lived, 
is currently living or will ever live. All of us were born with uh, a nature that's in opposition to God through uh, the fall, through man turning away. We are by nature sinners. We, we sin because we're sinners. Sin starts to manifest itself in our lives as we get um, older, as we grow, we start to make the choices, we start to commit the sins of Adam. We start to do things, think things, uh, behave in certain ways that are contrary to God's holiness and righteousness and justice. That's what the, the heart is, is, is like a, a sin factory, produces um, uh, sinful uh, acts uh, in every single person. So there's no one better than anybody else. All of us fall short of the glory of God. Now, some of us, when you look throughout history, some people sin more greatly than others, more notably than others. But all of us, whether you're in the gutter or whether you're on the mountaintop, none of us can reach the stars. We're all fallen short of the glory of God. And the thing about living without Christ as a sinner in a sinful world, is this, life is hard. It's impossible to find the peace of God without God. It's impossible to find peace with God without God. So if we live our lives away from Christ, away from the gospel, rejecting the gospel, thinking, well, no, I'll find peace myself. I'll, the, the, the troubles in my life uh, I can get rid of. So even if we're prosperous, even if we have money, even if we have all the things that people naturally pursue to give them pleasure all of those things still leave us with a void something that cannot be uh, dealt with we find bitternesses in life we find trouble in life we find strife in life we find lack of lasting comfort happiness is an illusion that we're always going after and we might have it for a season but it's never permanent it, it can slip through our fingers like sand Lasting comfort is, is not something that humanity has ever known. They're just illusions. We have an illusion before, so it'll all be okay. Um, you hear that kind of conversation even through the current coronavirus pandemic, or when we get to the other side, when we get to the other side, well, when we get to the other side, we'll find there's more trouble because the world is full of trouble. Our hearts are full of trouble. That's why we need a saviour. God isn't being... Uh, harsh with us because he wants to be harsh he's telling us the truth if you go to the doctor and there's something wrong with you you want the doctor to tell you you need some treatment you don't want him to say oh you'll be all right we well, won't be all right there's something there's a disease in the human heart of sin and it's so bad that that's why christ had to come and die because someone had to die who had no sin in order that sin could be visited upon them unjustly that the rest of us can then receive the righteousness of christ so the Bible says the fruit of the righteous is peace. Those who come to know Christ, the fruit of the righteous is peace. But it also says the way of the sinner is hard. Life without Christ is hard. That's why it says that he will rule them with a rod of iron. It feels like life is just like a rod of iron upon our backs. Well, it's because we were never designed to live without God. Never. Well, was mankind meant to live independently of God? That's what's gone wrong. We're like sheep without a shepherd, wandering around, trying to find pasture for ourselves. Prone to the enemies and the wild beasts that attack sheep, we have the equivalent in our own lives. Now, then it also goes on really to say that um, we can see that uh, this ruling with a rod of iron isn't just physical difficulty. It can be in our minds as well. A troubled conscience is is a rod of iron to us it's very hard to live with a troubled conscience you may have noticed that i know i've noticed that if you feel guilty um, for something you've said or done or thought that you knew was wrong and you think well why do i feel guilty well it's because we are guilty and our consciences tell us we're guilty they shout at us we can't do anything to get rid of a guilty conscience other than know that it's been forgiven through Christ. Now, perhaps for some Christians watching today, there's a difference between a guilty conscience and condemnation. And many Christians, I know, do have sensitive consciences. And we can often feel that God is angry with us and God is displeased with us when he isn't. 
The Bible says anyone who is in Christ, there is now no condemnation. It doesn't say, well, there's a little bit of condemnation, or there might be some condemnation, or perhaps you never know, you might end up having a little bit of condemnation. No, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That means all my sins, past, present and future, have been forgiven in and through the shed blood of Christ. They've been placed on him. So even when and if I do sin now, or have done in the past, or will do in the future, there is provision, there is enough provision in Christ's sacrifice that whatever I may do by way of sinfulness, it, it is already forgiven. Christ has done uh, all that was necessary for that to be the case. So a guilty conscience can be completely cleansed for those who are in Christ. Now, for those who, who may be watching who don't as yet know the Lord, well, we can sometimes find ourselves awake at night, troubled by things, troubled by things we've done, troubled by our attitudes, troubled. There's all sorts of internal things that we can't find any peace or answer to. And we can numb it with alcohol or drugs or distract ourselves with pleasure. We can just sort of try to put it to the back of our, our minds. We can think, well, I'm not going to think about that. It's like having a stone in your shoe. You can just adjust the way you walk to compensate for it, but you know it's still there. Now, a troubled, guilty conscience can only, only be cleansed, healed, restored, removed by having Christ come and take that stone out of our shoe and say, I have paid the price for your guilt to be that which is crimson red to be washed so that it's as white as snow that's why jesus died on the cross he didn't die to leave us a good example he died because we need our consciences cleansing our lives forgiving he, he died because there's a need he wants to bring peace that's what the peace of god does it passes all understanding so even if our things we we, that we've lived all our lives feeling guilty for. When we come to know Christ, there's no reason now for any guilt ever to be plaguing our consciences. It's all been placed on him. That's the beauty of it. So a conscience is like a, being ruled with a rod of iron. And sometimes, you know, we go through um, a time of, of awakening. Perhaps you're watching this and you're not a Christian and you're feeling more and more guilty. You're feeling more and more. I mean, in Romans 7, Paul says, you know, I think he's describing his journey to become a Christian. And he says, you know, the good I want to do that I can't do and what I know I should do that I can't do. And he's reflecting, he's like, oh, who's going to deliver me from this body of death? He's, like, he's looking at himself saying, man, my sinfulness, my guilt, my inner compulsions are making me feel like I'm a prisoner to sin. I can't, who's going to set me free from this? Who's going to give me peace? And he says, thanks be to God through Christ. He realises that the way to find peace inwardly is through what Christ did externally being applied to our hearts. And listen, if you're going through that journey, don't be like Pharaoh, you know, the story of Moses and Pharaoh and the people coming out of Egypt and Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey him? This kind of arrogance in our hearts where we say, I'm not going to, I'm not going to submit to Christ. I'm not going to bow the knee to Christ. I'm not going to let him tell me what to do. I'm not going to, not going to let another person rule over me. That kind of hardening of heart is just like a rod of iron that just makes life even more difficult for us. Don't fight the Holy Spirit. Don't fight what he's doing in your life because God doesn't want anyone to perish. Jesus came because he loves you. God so loved the world. He's not, he doesn't want to judge the world. He doesn't want to do that. Inevitably, there will come a day when just like the leaves fall off a fig tree, judgment will come for all those who harden their hearts to Christ. So I will not have this man rule over me. But that's not the day we're in now. Now is a day of grace where you can find Christ. Maybe even this morning, this may just somehow stimulate you to turn to Christ if you don't know. Maybe as a Christian it'll strengthen you, give you a thankful heart that God has delivered you from this body of death, as it were. Certainly when I look at the pandemic going on at the moment, one of the things it has done is it's, it's, um, it's awakened uh, an awareness of our mortality 
and every human being now is beginning to think, well, I could die. And it's taken control or perceived control out of our hands. We thought we were in control, now we realise we're not. That's a good thing, actually, that we come to that realisation. A pandemic isn't a good thing, of course not. And God hates it and he wants a vaccine found and we're praying that that will happen. But God will still use it to help us come back to our shepherd when we're like sheep who've wandered off. He won't come back, come back, come back. He's calling you back if you don't know him. So that even through this troubling time, you might find something you think, wow, I'm so pleased I found Christ during what was a really anxious season of life. And then we see Messiah and broken pots, this last bit. He'll dash them like a potter's vessel. Now, a pot may be made out of very expensive things or very commonplace things. It may be very ornate or it may be just a clay pot. Either way, pots get broken. Pots are not indestructible. And this says that ultimately there's going to come a day when all pots that uh, don't submit to Christ will get dashed to pieces. They just get broken on the floor. Whether you have the most ornate pot or a common pot, there's traces of beauty in it. It's, it's a bit like mankind. We're majestic, though in ruins. God has made us wonderfully, beautifully, amazingly. He never designed us to be smashed like pottery. He made us to live forever with him. But there'll come a time when the wages of sin is death. What we, what we sow, like a farmer or a gardener, if you sow a packet of weeds, well, weeds will come up You'll get flowers where you've sown weeds. It's the consequence. And there'll come a time when the consequence for living a life away from God, like Adam and Eve did, saying, I will not have this man rule over me. Well, we lose life. And Jesus didn't die to give us a good example. He died because there's a hell to avoid. There's separation eternally from God to avoid. It's a serious matter. Do you know, the Roman Empire... Most at the time, the greatest empire the world had ever known was smashed to pieces. It came to ruin. That which seemed to be able to just smash and crush Christ, crucify him. Persecuted Christians, Roman emperors, persecuted Christians, stamped the church out. It was the church that flourished and the Roman Empire collapsed. It's the same today. Whenever God's people are oppressed, persecuted whenever the church is attempted to be stamped out and it's going on all over the world at the moment often it doesn't make the headlines because the, the, the media only tell us the sadnesses that they want us to hear but Christ's church is being persecuted today as it always has been but it never will be destroyed why because Christ is in her and Christ will smash like pottery all that which opposes him We will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, is what the Bible says, whether great or small, and we will all have to give account for our lives. Now that may not be a popular truth, it may, may not be something you believe, but the Bible says that that is what's going to happen. And what we have to decide is, is the Bible telling us the truth? Because if that is the truth, then it makes the sense of why Jesus came to die for us. Because there is a judgment to come. It's not now, although God still judges sin in the world and the wages of sin is death. There's all kinds of consequences of sin we see around us now, as I've explained. But only those in Christ who will stand before that judgment seat, only those who can say, well, Christ is my saviour, I've received him into my life, I'm not standing because of my own righteousness or goodness, my plea is that he died for me and I've received him into my life. That is the only way that we can confidently look towards the future, not only in this life, but also in the life to come. And I want to encourage you, those of you without Christ this morning, well, flee to Christ, turn to him. This is still a day of grace and of mercy. And you maybe have been, I don't know, feeling the pull of the gospel for many years and have not done anything about it. Well, that tug that you're feeling in your heart is the Holy Spirit. It's Christ, the shepherd of your heart, wanting you to become 
in the fold of his uh, of believers that follow him and let him be their shepherd so today is a good day just to perhaps pray and say Jesus if you're real would you lead me into truth and for Christians what a great thing it is that we can give thanks that we're not going to be smashed as pottery we've been shown wonderful wonderful mercy because God loves us and he sent his son to die for us just as we go through this day that will those thoughts will encourage us See you next time.